start with art and politics. Would you like to talk about that, which I believe you said your entire work is about? Yeah, I mean, as I was thinking about this event, and um, I mean, I'm not that comfortable really talking about myself, but uh, I, that's what you come to sort of hear. So I thought I'd, I'd think a bit about it, and um, and um, I, I, I guess you know what's. Um, there are obviously um, constant factors in one's life that drive one to to do what one does. And uh, and when I was nine, I wrote a letter to the London Evening Standards complaining about the um, U.S. Apollo space mission, saying that you know it's all very well sending another man to the moon, but America doesn't even have its own health service. So you know perhaps the money could be better spent on other things. <laughs> And that's quite nice, but what was absolutely amazing was I got a letter from NASA saying, oh, dear Michael, we read your letter with interest, and, and we'd just like to point out the very many beneficial aspects of the U.S. space mission and how many people have benefited from it. And so I just thought, in a way, that was a kind of, in a way, that set me off, in a way, I suppose. Um, and then... And then when I was 11, I, 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 I took up the trumpet and, and, and I was very and sort of life sort of dedicated to sort of music. Um, but obviously, I've always maintained an interest in, in politics and world events and and, um, and the fact that you can, you know, you can ask questions and um, you don't necessarily get answers, but maybe that's not even the point. Um, and then I was, I was just to tell you briefly how I sort of came to be doing what I'm doing. I was. So I went to music college, studied music, and tried to be a musician and record producer. And uh, and I was lucky. I was a music college at the time I was there. I actually studied uh, electronic music composition with um, with a, a guy that was actually one of Moog's original team. So I kind of got into recording and um, that sort of thing. And then. Uh, failed completely to sort of establish a, a f firm and successful career in music. So I, I kind of pivoted, as they as the, they use the word nowadays, uh, into <laughs> film and you television. You gave up the trumpet. I, I gave up the trumpet, and but but what I did, my my musical knowledge and experience landed me a job, um, incredibly fortuitously um, at Mentorn Films, uh, in the sort of mid. 80s working on a weekly arts magazine program called O One for London, and there were various regional versions. ITV show, and it was just the most fantastic job imaginable. I mean, each week we had to find eight interesting things that were happening in the East Anglia region, and that's sometimes a challenge. <laughs> but 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 what it gave us was a huge amount of freedom to just make eight little mini films about art, theatre, music, cinema whatever may or may not have been happening in that region. And we had three or four crew days a week to do this. And we would, um, and the only kind of relationship I had with the commissioning editor there was they would, every Christmas, send us a Christmas card saying, another great year, well done, keep up the good work. I mean, the le I mean the, whatever the opposite of micromanagement is, <laughs> that that's what it was. And but course, it was a different time, wasn't it? It was the 80s, yeah. it was a golden time, Channel 4 had just started. Channel 4 had just started, so Mentorn and other companies like it were growing up, you know, ba you know based, on, based on that new reality, um, which we obviously have Margaret <coughs> Thatcher to thank for, because I wasn't a unionised person, so they really opened up the free market in... in, in film and television production, which, you know, um, obviously for me and for many others was a very good thing. Um, and Channel 4, of course, is a very good thing. There's no question. It's sort of changed. You know, again, I grew up with this whole, you know, uh, idea that there were alternative voices, and that's, again, ideally what Channel 4 is supposed to represent is alternative voices and contradictory voices. And... Um, so, so just try to speed forward, and then I, 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 I also the other amazing stroke of luck was when I was at Mentor, and I, I was given the job to produce um, the slot, the Friday night slot, which eventually became Three Minute Wonders, and now doesn't exist as a slot. Occasionally, it still exists as a slot during the elections, and they have election stuff, political stuff. But, but for seven years, every Friday night at five to eight, I had a slot. And, and that was, and I, obviously I worked very closely with the commissioning editor of Channel 4, who was Valdemar Januszczak, who was and is the uh, art critic for the Sunday Times. So Monday morning we'd have a conversation about what was interesting this week, 
uh, and and by Thursday, if we hadn't found anything, we we started to get worried. But but by Friday morning, we record this thing, uh, and it went out, and it was an, again an amazing way of being again art and politics being able to respond creatively to to a week's news, whatever that was, and uh, so. And that obviously, obviously, gave me a very close relationship with Valdemar. We, and when he left, he was booted out of Channel Four for being too good, and <laughs> I left Mentor at that moment because it just when it merged with Mentor America Perry, which it still is. And we set up a company called ZCZ, and for eleven years made a ton of arts programs and other things. And again, I, 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 could, I can't imagine anything I would want to do more than that. And it still is what I want to do. I want to make films about art and ideas and, and um, you know, it's reflect these and, and continue the, these ideas. So, um, you said that you like making films about troublemakers. Well, yeah, I mean, that, moving <laughs> forward, that now, I think, I, again, knowing I was going to be talking about myself, <laughs> Um, and our work, because uh, obviously I am part of a team of people. It's not just me, but um, but yeah, we. I, I realise that really we're very fixated on on troublemakers and people who are, you know, whether they're Pussy Riot or Fiddle or, or you know, or, or I'm going to show you some other clips of other people. But they're people who are, you know, doggedly and you know, uh, 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 you know, causing trouble and, and contradicting the narrative and that's I think what human beings are born to do I think we're not we're born to ask questions and we're born to challenge and not accept um, what we're told because um, very often what we're told is not that helpful to us and is not in our interests very often so um, so I, I think I just want to show the first clip which is um, a, 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 the opening few minutes of um, a series we made for Channel 4 about Picasso, who... Well, could I just interrupt? I yeah. mean, that was one of <clears throat> several films that you made over that time, mm -hmm. shot on 16mm, mm -hmm. I mean, sort of golden um, yeah, commissions, I, in we, a way. You we said would, the budget was... We were talking about, if, if I was going to make this film today, which wouldn't be a bad idea, Picasso is still a very important figure that hasn't really been kind of nailed. I mean, uh, th th this series with, was with John Richardson, who is his great biographer and his great friend. And John Richardson has definitely uh, explained and established Picasso's life better than anybody else. However, and, and this film is based on his work, so, uh, but if we were doing it today, I would, you know, do it as a feature doc and, you know, but this, this thing was funded by Channel 4 very adequately. I mean, again, it's the sort of money that you couldn't dream of, of, of actually raising for a single broadcaster, you know, uh, today. So we were reminiscing about the days where you'd actually pay <laughs> properly to, to make things. But um, but it, it was well-resourced. And, um, and and you uh, went on to do films about La Trek and yeah, we did Sickert. A whole, and yeah, and uh, we did a Van Gogh series for, for Channel 4. And we did a big Gauguin film, two-hour film for BBC on, for, on Gauguin and, 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 and various others, as well as films on contemporary art. And we did a very um, notorious film called Beijing Swings, which was a film about the... Uh, about contemporary art in China and in, in Beijing in particular, and it managed to annoy lots of people because one of the artist's work um, contains series of images of him eating a baby, um, which was a commentary on various things. Um, and so the unfortunately the sort of religious lobby I won't name any particular religion, but it, you know uh, lobbied Channel Four to complain about it. And then the Chinese went crazy because we did this film completely without any permission whatsoever. So the Chinese embassy called the head of Channel 4 in to explain what the hell was going on. <laughs> so this film really... We should have pulled a clip from that. We could have pulled a clip from that. It's true. It's a very nice film. But uh, but it was, again, you know, um, in, a day, in a time when Channel 4 would just, you know, commission a film like that. You know, what's going on in Chinese contemporary art and... And um, so, yeah. so, in a way, just before we go to the films that are more familiar to you, what, what you're saying is that at that time you kind of got a film school education on on the on the job, as it were. Totally. I, I, I do, again, so I, I one of the most the best ideas I ever had was when I sort of was transitioning from from uh, you know, music uh, to, to to television or film. I took a, um, a secretarial course and I learned to do shorthand and typing. 
and I then got a series of jobs uh, temping, and I worked for Jeremy Isaacs at the Royal Opera House. Oh, really? I worked for Colin McCabe at the BFI. I worked for Michael Topping at BBC Co-Productions. So immediately, without any experience whatsoever in any of these fields, I was because, and I was a male PA, so at the time that was considered a bit sort of interesting. <laughs> and I was a reasonable typist and shorthand taker, and so I, I, I could do the job. But it, it, I worked on Panorama, they get, you know, all this. So, so kind of out of nowhere, I sort of suddenly, within a year, I had a kind of really kind of good looking CV, which, um, so, I mean, and, and again, today you wouldn't do that. People don't have PAs, they, they type their own emails and. Does anybody do shorthand anymore? I mean, maybe journalists do, but I imagine most of them use uh, tape recorders. Got email. Yeah, tape recorders and email. So, um, anyway, bygone age. Well, um, in a way, a bygone age, but let's just look at the opening, uh, uh, the, uh, the opening pre-title sequence yeah. for Picasso. Magic, Sex and Death. That's the one. 19, 2001. <laughs> It's always hard to explain how an artist works. And because you can't explain it, then you have to bring up the word magic. You know, he starts a drawing and his hand goes into a direction and you really can't figure out what he's about to do. His technique was impeccable. He was trained academically by his father. He would never make a silly technical mistake. He didn't have to have a palette and a little painting and just going around and making nice little paintings. He was, you know, doing something else. He was, you know, wrecking a havoc. And then suddenly you discover, after all, you thought it might become a woman, but actually it's a, it's a goat. But then his pen goes on and transforms it into a fish. It's a never-ending process. And that was what was interesting to him, to see where his mind would take him. You, uh, you know what it is? Voodoo. Do you understand voodoo? I mean, and the, the other reason I wanted to show this clip was, is, gets onto the, the kind of filmmaking process. And, and I think what is, what art essentially is, is, is the ability to make something out of nothing. And that clip obviously shows you, I mean, he's got a few bits of junk, you know, and he makes a work of art. And, you know, these documentary films that we're all trying to make, I mean, we're scrabbling together and tying things up with bits of string and putting, a, 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 trying to order chaos and total randomness and put all these scraps together and make a work of art. And um, sometimes successfully, sometimes not. But I think that's a very uh, important idea to have and that, you know, that that's what makes them different is that you are trying to make something out of nothing. So you go out and you film an interview, you get all these bits and pieces together and you try and tell a story and try and uh, create magic, I would say, <laughs> um, if for 90 minutes or three minutes or, or however long, you know, the film wants or needs to be. So. Uh, so I do think there's something um, important about that, and, um, and, and you know, um, anyway, that's why I wanted to show. But in a way, it's, in a way, kind of like Picasso, uh, uh, anybody, yes, you can go and get the piece of string and the interview, whatever, but you have to have a drive, don't you? You have to have a desire um, to tell something that's unique to you. I mean, I think the thing I think about documentary is that you're actually adding to the body of knowledge in that you have a point of view. It's your, unlike the news or uh, anthropological ga uh, information gathering, it's a point of view that you're trying to put across, which is a deeper perception, is it not? Yeah, I, I, would, I, would, I would classify these f films that we're talking about, and we could get into the whole debate about fiction and non-fiction and what is a documentary and all that, which is a you know, very interesting but uh, constant uh, conversation. Uh, but I would characterize them as creative works of art. And what that means is the use of image and sound and language, and sometimes none of those things, to convey an idea. And, about, and, 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 it, and they either do it successfully or they don't. So, you know, um, but, that, but that is the ambition, is to use these, uh, these elements, these 
very, uh, sometimes very elusive uh, scraps uh, to tell something compelling and important to the filmmakers. Um, and so anybody trying to do that, I have every admiration and support for, because uh, it, is, it is quite tricky. <laughs> but I do think it's worth doing. And I think now more than ever, I mean, we're, we're talking now in this current circumstance, political circumstance, which is obviously beyond depressing and terrifying. And I do think the only weapon we have is art, is the only thing we can have to fight against these forces of greed and, and, and terror. Um, so um, I'm sorry if I'm being a bit dramatic, but I, I think it's the case. That's fine, absolutely yeah. fine. Now, um, I'm very happy to go to questions at any point. I do want to talk about, I think we need to follow on that conversation with what you feel your role as a producer is for the director. But do we have any questions right now? No, we don't. <laughs> so um, let's just first, just first clarify, you, you made those films for all for Channel 4? Well, some for the BBC as well. And for the yeah, BBC, yeah. but as an independent production company. That's right, yeah. And then in 2007, mm -hmm. you set up Roast Beef. Mm -hmm. Um, why did you do that? Um, well, like my relationship with 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 Valvana came to a sort of natural end, and um, and it coincided with uh, my colleagues Martin and Ian and and, and others' um, desire to set up a, a new company to make uh, some travelogue programs with Ian Wright, which we still do, um, and to do whatever else we wanted to do. And what we began to want to do is make feature documentaries. So actually, Afghan Star was our first um, film. Havana Marking, the director of that film, which we will see a clip of or the trailer for in a minute. Um, um, Tell me how you developed a relationship. How did that come well, about? Well, Havana, Mar Martin had directed a film for Channel 4, again, for, for Jess Search, for the uh, independent film and video when it existed there. I mean. Okay. Why exactly. don't, I mean, it's, it makes me cry to think that we don't even have that. Well, it became BritDot, which is not quite the it same thing, It became BritDot, but, but yeah. I mean, it wasn't uh, the same, it was it? <laughs> BritDot doesn't have slots on the national television channel, which it should. I mean, I know it's disseminating his work in lots of other ways, but... Uh, anyway, uh, so Martin directed a thing, and Havana was the producer on it, and they got on very well, and then she just got this story of, of the Afghan star, this kind of pop idol competition in Afghanistan. This is 2008, I believe. Has anyone seen that film? Oh, well done. Yeah, so it's about a pop Just music, film. thank you, yeah, a pop music competition in Afghanistan that was uh, really uh, very, obviously, revolutionary. They didn't have had any television programs, so, so this was definitely a, a mold-breaking, and it was... Um, and we had the opportunity, we worked with the TV company that was producing the thing, so we worked with them and um, went out on, and, you know, and... And, and, and this and, was in uh, high Taliban time, was it not? Well, it was a moment of relative um, calm, um, certainly compared to uh, subsequent times, and it was a, certainly a, an emergence. I mean, it was actually, you know, this 2008, so it was, you know, heading towards the establishment of some kind of national um, uh, institutions and, and government and, and, and indeed television channels. So it was the emergence of a youth culture there and, um, and a TV culture there. So it was sort of, was relatively optimistic time, so. And so just to go through it, so Havana said you, <clears throat> I want to direct a film about the Afghan star. It's a television program in Afghanistan. And you said, <laughs> how did that, how did mean, that it develop? Well, it just immediately knew that that was a good idea, I mean, um, and immediately wanted to do it, and she wanted to do it with us, so that was, it, it was, a, you know, it was another cliche, a no-brainer, it was, um, and we had this sufficient kind of uh, people on the ground and people in Afghanistan that we, you know, we weren't just going to turn up, <laughs> oh, we're here in Afghanistan, you know, it's like, uh, so we, we, I was confident that we had the, Resources and the and the expertise, if you like, and the, uh, and the uh, to to do it and safely and um, adequately. So um, you know, and, but uh, I mean, of course, you know, you never quite know how these things are going to turn out. And certainly, the narrative of the film is uh, talking about troublemakers. is very much about Satara. So the f competition ha attracted four thousand uh, entr entrants, out of which three were women. 
So we decided, okay, we're going to follow the women. <laughs> and one of them dropped out quite early, but two of them, and they represent very different aspects of, 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 of what it is to be a woman in Afghanistan. And one of them, Satara, was a very rebellious, not secular, but definitely rebellious individual who actually loses the competition, but when she's dancing on stage, her headscarf drift, you know, falls and she carries on dancing on stage without a headscarf, which is tantamount to the biggest blasphemy you could possibly uh, commit in, in at the, even at that time in Afghanistan. And so she becomes the victim of death threats and all this kind of stuff. So from turning into a kind of nice thing about pop music competition, it suddenly becomes absolutely essential guide to the state of the nation and its attitudes towards secularism, if you like, or, or modernity of any sort, you know, so, which is still, still a subject. I mean, of course, you know, the numbers of women in school and university in Afghanistan have increased enormously, so things have changed a bit, but there's still a huge amount of pressure to reverse that change, as we know, so... Uh, so were you in, in Afghanistan filming with her uh, at we the time were, that yeah. this happened? Yeah, she was there, and then we came out to, sort of towards the end of the competition. To, uh, Martin and I were, were there, and she was there with our colleague Phil Stebbing, who, who, who again, I've worked with for, for many, many years. And uh, so they were, you know, we had our little team there. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, looking back on it, I suppose it's quite a sort of, <laughs> sort of, I don't know, ambitious thing to do, but we obviously were very compelled to, to do this. And uh, and again, we um, that was with the bits of funding from Brit Doc. They really right. got the ball rolling with that. Oh, great. No question. And then eventually, um, and then we then we got a sales agent which put some money in, and then eventually um, we, I um, can't remember how we finished funding the film, Channel 4 put some money in. Yeah, that's right, Channel 4 uh, actually also commissioned it, which... Uh, uh, Peter Dale, yeah, great. his regime, which again we sorely miss. Absolutely. Shall we watch the clip? It's the trailer. One,
اگه میخونم اما شرط شدای تشتاگی بخونم بله 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 Still good. <laughs> it is good, and we actually did a follow-up film to, to that for HBO um, about Satara, who went on to get married, have a child, sadly lost the child, and then eventually she ends up actually in Germany. So, I mean, she does get sort of hounded out of her country, but she she's still alive, thank goodness. So, yeah, I mean, and again, you know, the randomness, I mean, again, that, so you set up to make a film about this competition, and it, it turns into this much bigger thing. And of course, if, you know, but, you know, she, if she had been killed, what kind of film would that be then? You know, it'd be like, you know, so you don't, I mean, thank God she wasn't, obviously, but, you know, you don't know. I mean, it's, in, and, and so that's why these films are, you know, I think they're, they're uncontrollable, really. The best ones are, you know. I mean, we're, we're, I'm sure if, if any of you are filmmakers and you've been pitching films, you're always asked to describe the narrative arc of the film and what's going to happen. And I mean, that's pointless, you know. The, the point is to actually find out and follow and not lead and not go in there with a the script saying, oh, then, then this is going to happen. I mean, so anyway, so, but I know that's not what most commissioning editors want to hear and or funders want to hear. They want to know they've got a film, but actually the best things are risk and risk implies failure. And, and, and uh, you know, the, the risk aversion in the world of art is a contradiction in terms. Absolutely. You can't have safe art. You can't have a predictable... It, it's, it's therefore not art. <laughs> Absolutely agreed. Any questions, anybody? Apart from sensitive people on Storyville, for example. So, <laughs> apart from commis uh, sensitive, sensitive commission editors on Storyville, how do you personally perpetuate the life of this film, given the slog, passion and the fearlessness you have to put in to make this? Because we all view it here and luxuriate and it is wonderful. Then what? What happens when the viewing figures are assessed? Do you have to find the next one? Describe the next arc of your film. How, how do you keep that alive, please? Well, thank you. That's an interesting question. Well, that that is the difference between a film and a television program. And I've made lots of television programs, and you make the program and you deliver it to the channel, and they show it. Yep. And if you're lucky, you get some good reviews, and quite a lot of people watch it, and then that's it. And it's a very soul-destroying thing. Whereas with these films, their life is. I mean, the, this film premiered at Sundance and won prizes and won other prizes at lots of other festivals and then got theatrical distribution in the States and in, the Euro and in Europe and, um, and, you know, and, and, and so, and then went on to a number of other television channels and eventually, I can't quite remember if it, I don't, if it is on, probably pre-Netflix, so it's not a Netflix thing, but, you know, uh, and, and now certainly the kind of way that, you know, a lot of, thank goodness, a lot of the films that we make, you know, ultimately end up on Netflix or Amazon or something like that. So they do have this life, you know, and that's, so that, and that's, the, I think that's what distinguishes it. People always say, what's the difference between a, a, a feature documentary, a cinematic documentary and, and a television program? Well, I think it, it's that, you know, you're not going to go to a film festival and watch Top Gear, you know, and, and, uh, or, or most Somebody might pick up the idea. Yeah, well, that's a good idea. <laughs> Top Gear. Top Gear, the movie, that's actually. That is a good idea. I'm sure they've probably thought about that. But yeah, I mean, what is it? It's, it's the fact that something does have a life, and it doesn't really matter how long it is. I mean, it could, obviously it applies to a short film and a long film, you know, a long film. Um, so what is it that makes something cinematic and epic? And, and again, I, I don't think it's the size of the screen you're watching it on. It's, it's, it, it, does it have the, the, the depth <laughs> to continued on its own steam and why in a hundred years time this film will be amazing to watch and go look at this folly the invasion of afghanistan and what we did look they tried to set up a tv show and i mean god i hope afghanistan in a hundred years time is is a stable progressive democracy and and there's no reason why it can't be but whatever condition it's in it will be very interesting to examine the role that media played <coughs> development etc but, but that is a very interesting point about making programs for television as opposed to making films be they on whatever platform cinema or, or online whatever they have a different intention mm -hmm. and I completely agree with that because I had a production company 
for 20 years and you built up this thing you went through a year of hell you got all your friends together in your living room you watched it on the television and it was gone and actually last week we had Joanna Natasgar here and she's you know in the last few years thanks to Britdo actually there's this group of producers who are saying well actually the life of the film begins at the end of uh, at the end of making it and that it has to have a longer life which documentary always has It always has had, actually. No, no, exactly. Tony Palmer, I mentioned this last week, Tony Palmer made Wagner, and when he was asked why he'd put all that money into it, whatever, he said, well, people will want to watch it in 30 years' time. Mm -hmm. And now that's true of a lot of documentary, not just music documentaries or art documentaries. Yeah, I, I, as I say, there, is, there are lots of panels and debates about what makes a cinematic feature documentary, and I, I think it's obvious, as, as I say, it's just because it is, because it's, it's a story or... As I say, this assemblage of image and sound and language to convey an idea that is big enough to, to, to survive. And if you're making a film about which car is better than another car, then that's not very interesting. If you're But even if you're making a program that in a way is led by someone telling you what to think, like we call show and tell documentaries, those those yeah. are mostly what's happening to tell ironically, what television used to be like before Uh, cinema Verite and yeah. direct cinema well, and everyone made films that didn't have a commentary that was so radical. Well, exactly. I mean, all of this this culture obviously, again, comes from somewhere and it comes from, a, m m not exclusively, but very much from British documentary television, documentary filmmaking. And, uh, you, you know, you've got things something like Culloden or, you know, you've mm. got these masterpieces of, of documentary filmmaking. Um, that used to be made here, and some still are. We, you know, we name check Storyville, and, 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 and there are still a couple of uh, around the world broadcasters are still existing that do see the, the value in these things. But, you know, I think largely we're moving away from that as a source, you know. Um, but that's okay, because in, in some respects, because it has been replaced by other resources, and more importantly, the evidence and belief that the audience for these kinds of work is growing and, uh, and is huge. And, I mean, that's what the Netflixes and the people of this world understand, is that there's a great deal of appetite for these big stories and, and told well. And, and, and I don't think that's going to diminish, and it's increasing all the time. So, you know, in many ways, these are very good times to be, to be making films, no question. And funnily enough, that's why I've got this series of producers' masterclasses, because you now no longer have a commissioning editor who gives you the money and says, well done this year. You have to find a producer who will slog away, raise the money, uh, go through the film and take it through to completion and even further. And that's why it's so important for all young filmmakers here that you find yourself a producer to work with, to help you to not only raise the money, but take you through the program, the, the filmmaking and even afterwards, which brings me back to Havana, because that was her first fi feature film, wasn't it? And so you shot it and then you came back. Are you very close as a producer in the cutting room? Um, uh, I, I'm a great believer in giving people the space to do the thing they want to do, and at the same time, if I feel strongly about certain things and I think <coughs> my comments would make the film better than I would certainly give them and I mean and you know films are a collaborative effort and uh, you know of course the director is driving it and, and is responsible to deliver it but at the same time good ideas can come from anywhere and you never somebody makes a good suggestion and it's, it's you know that improves the film and that's that's always good so yeah if there is some you know I, I, I certainly like to participate in that process it's obviously very uh, enriching and enjoyable thing to do but um But at the same time, um, you know, I, only if I feel I can be useful. <laughs> so if the director says, I need four more months editing, <clears throat> do you go out and search for the money or do you well, say no I way? I guess if I, if I agree that that's the case, um, and that particular sort of scenario hasn't really happened on the whole, especially in this country. I mean, people in America edit for years, you know. I mean, in this country we tend to have much shorter edit periods, and I think that can be a good thing, you know, I think, um, mm -hmm. um, so, but, yeah, I mean, as I say, every film is different. I mean, in terms of funding, I mean, every case is different. The things change all the time. You know, there is no magic bullet 
to make a, f a film. And, you know, all, all I can say is it's never the same twice. And whatever experience you have, actually, that can sometimes be a disadvantage because you're not open to the new things that you don't know about. So actually, you should just forget everything you've ever done. And there are no qualifications for making a great film. There is just the burning ambition and energy and let's suppose some amount of talent that pours into these into these 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 creations you know and um and, and some are easier than others you know i mean i've had films where i've just had a piece of paper gone to someone and go that's fantastic here's the money i mean that doesn't happen very often but it, it, it can happen and at the same time you can struggle and struggle and struggle and in fact you know um some of our you know bigger hits if you like have been difficult very difficult to find you know and, and you just you know, and, 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 and eventually it all works out because you sell it and you get the money and da-da. But the, the, the problem with that, and this is a big problem, is that, you know, what, you need the money when you're making the film, you know, and so it's, it's, you, you have to, it's a very fine balance. There's no point getting $2 million for it, sell it at Sundance, and, you know, that money is great. Okay, it's, 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 it's profit, but it's, it, you could have used a lot of that resource a year before to make the film better. So, so that is about cash flow is the most problematic aspect of most creative acts. And producing. <laughs> yeah. Because you also executive produce. I mean, <clears throat> I just got a question here that I hadn't thought of before. Uh, we're going to talk about To Hell and Back again. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, Afghan Star certainly meets your uh, kind of uh, thing of art and politics making a difference. So this is a much more clearly political film. So, just before we talk about that, what makes you decide a roast beef? Okay, we'll go with that one and not go with that one. Well, um, just when, as I say, Havana says, oh, there's this pop music competition in Afghanistan and we can have access to it, and I go, yes. <laughs> and then when Dan from Dennis, and, and, and I think what makes Hannah Back again a, an art film is, is the quality of the, the photography and, and the fact it's very much a visual storytelling and created by an artist i don't think there's any doubt about that and so we meet him and again make you know again the connection between one film he came to us because he saw afghanistan i thought it was an amazing film and said well you guys know to make films in afghanistan so uh, do you want to help me make this film and he just returned from his first trip there showed us some of his rushes and he's just going this is the most amazing thing i've ever seen so yes you know um, and again, again, what difficult film to fund, a difficult film to get to get made actually, because is you know, I mean, I won't name the name, but um, um, and, uh, you know, but someone at the national channel broadcasting channel said, oh, we've had enough films in Afghanistan, we don't need more films in Afghanistan. Aye, aye, aye. You know? well. So, what's that yeah. channel for? No, the channel four ended up showing it. So, uh, <laughs> so it's not channel four. <laughs> okay. Um, but that there was the time came when that happened. Started to happen a lot, wasn't it? You know, if you wanted to make a film about Kafka, oh no, we've done a Kafka last year, which we'll talk about later. Yeah, <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean. Um, okay, so and uh, it was his first film. He was a stills photographer. Well, he's a stills photographer who who has a Canon 5D. And his notice is that there's a video switch on it, and he just kind of goes, "Oh, okay, what does that do?" <laughs> and then starts to make a, a eventually Academy-nominated film. Uh, and he, in a way, it was one of the early 5D films, <clears throat> and he had his own Steadicam rig, so he's on the front line in Afghanistan. Just and it looks like a movie, and he's, as I say, a, a really particularly talented photographer. So the images and the just the relationship to the subject that the camera has is 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 astonishing. So again, you know, it's um, it was a kind of random thing, but uh, it, it had to had to be. It had to be. And were you there on location with him, or was that no. afterwards? No, he was on his own. He was an embedded. Uh, he was he was f photographing for uh, Time magazine, I think, or New York Times, can't remember. And so he had an official embed with this company, Marines, as they are. Uh, it was the biggest. Uh, um, uh, um, campaign since the Second World War. So there's 20,000 American troops deep into Helmand province. It was a big push. Um, just and, and that's what the story covers, as well as the co consequences of participating yeah. in that push for the lead captain uh, who, who returns wounded. And, and really, the film is about the consequences of, of, of 
returning to home. Broken and, and broken and trying to readjust. Yeah. Shall we show the clip, please? It's time to change the game in Afghanistan. We're experts in the application of violence. When you move, move with a sense of purpose and aggression intent on finishing the enemy. Your conscience should be clear and your honor should be clean. I just remember looking at the clouds thinking, you gotta breathe. not a television program. <laughs> no, definitely not. So were you involved in the post-production heavily on that? Yeah, we, uh, Dan Funger was actually living in London at the time and we we bought the incredible Fiona Otway, um, who's cut a number of amazing films, uh, <clears throat> over from New York, I think she was living at the time. Anyway, so yeah, we, 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 we planned the, all the post in, in London and and again, you know, there, there's a classic example, I mean, you know, Fiona and Dan Fung in a room together for several months make a work of art, you know, and is again, and w w one might have certain suggestions and th things to say, but it's more about, you know, I, it's the f I suppose, the, how, to, how to present the film, really. I, I guess the producer's role is, is ultimately marketing what the film is, really, and, and that's a very important thing to understand, and a very important thing to understand at the very earliest stages of making a film. I mean, I actually think that the title and the poster of a film should be really solidly in your mind so you can make the film, because that's what you're presenting. You know, if you've got one hit, a poster, it's like a book cover, I suppose, but, or an, an album cover, you know, I mean, it's, it's like you get one chance in a very busy marketplace to convey what your thing might be about. So any kind of vagueness or obscurity is is really not going to help and it, it's true for the film itself you know you, it, the, the simpler the idea the more direct the more energy you put into making that simple idea conveyed um, the more people will like it how many times do you think you had to pitch that film for money this one oh, oh um, I don't know I'm, I'm a, a dozen times I don't know something like that you know I mean Amazing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but when you've, I mean, yeah, and it's and it's surprising because all the things, I mean, again, we had very good material very early on, so you're presenting this thinking going, this is amazing, isn't it? And people go, yeah, but we still don't want to do it. You know, it's just because it's amazing is not enough of a reason quite often. <laughs> it's true. It's just like, because, because, oh, we've had too many Afghan films. Or we don't want war films. Who wants? Who cares about war? You know? So what do you do? You just go into the next one, or you just yeah, keep pushing? you keep going. I mean, you know, obviously it's 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 inconvenient and it's a drain <laughs> on your time and and morale. But I mean, I don't become convinced by their argument. I mean, you know, as you were saying before, you know, we see a thing and we go, yeah, we absolutely do anything to make that film happen and be as good as it can possibly be. 
And, you know, um, we're, we're not saying we're never wrong. Some films are better than others, but we never, we never change our minds about it. It's, it's like, it, it's, it's, it is a belief, you know, in, in, this, in, the, in, the, in the director and in the subject and in the, and the, uh, the whole concept of what the film is trying to convey. And that's what I'm saying. You have to have what is it you're trying to convey. What really is the film about? And, and, uh, and that's, you, that's the hardest thing usually to, um, to discover. <laughs> And it's a long haul. Any questions, anyone? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, how do you calculate how much money you need to make the film <laughs> as well? Is there a formula or do you just go off experience? Well, what you have to do is calculate the minimum amount of money you're going to need to get the film to a, reason, to a state where you can sell it. Um, Which is? Well, again, it varies. It depends what you have to do. If you have to spend a year filming in the middle of nowhere, then that's quite expensive, you know. Or so th different films demand different allocation of resources. But yeah, I mean, you just have an instinct. Again, I've been making films and television programs for thirty years, so I kind of get a feeling of how long something's going to take to shoot and how it's going to take to edit and who would you want to edit again. It's like. There's a cheap way of doing it, and then there's the right way of doing it. It's so, yeah, it's, and it's never usually enough, you know. So you're always, and, and people, you know, don't get paid, essentially, until you sell the film. I mean, that's the other thing. Very often people, most of these really great films, people have spent two years on nothing, living off their credit cards, trying to get this thing done, very often, you know. And that, again, in a way, that's what makes them so good. They're not just like, oh, here's another, you've got a 10 film output deal with the BBC, so here's what, what are you going to do next? It's like, you know, it, it, that, that will always result in really boring failures, you know. I mean, it's when you have to really struggle in all ways, then something is good, and or it dies off because it actually, you know, it's really, really not going to, it's really not going to happen. So, but, you know, we have great faith, and, and we, I never give up on projects. I mean, even got lots of things that have not been made yet, but I still believe they will be. <laughs> but also, you, in between showing the films that we're showing here, that you've exec, you're an executive producer. I don't quite know what that means. Maybe you could explain. It. On on quite a few other, like young filmmakers, like Christoph and Elephant's Dream, um, and there's uh, what's the other one I was thinking of? Um, quite a few actually. I've just got them here on my on my list. You did a white poverty. Um, and you did the do-gooders, you know, several films that you've exec on. What, what does that really mean? Well, I guess that means um, that you probably come into the film at a later stage um, and that you're, you're more focused on just trying to get the film funded and, you know, um, sold. Um, and... I don't know, I mean, sometimes it can have a, a similar degree of creative input as well. I mean, it can, again, you know, as I say, if I think something's wrong, I'm going to say it, you know, and, um, and they can decide whether that's correct or not. But, um, you know, I'm not going to just be indifferent to something I think could be better. Um, so, I don't know, it's a nebulous term. I mean, ultimately, people obviously always say, you know, what, what, how do you define what a producer is? And... I would just say it's you know a creative partner in a uh, in a film. It's like and that means you're just doing whatever is needed to do to get the film created, mm. um, and that can be all sorts of things. And you know, and some people need more help than others as well. Some filmmakers they just kind of here's a film, made it, and go great. Help me get the money. <laughs> yeah, let's just sell it. You know, and and and, and you know, and and that, and that's obviously you know less work in, in many ways, you know, but, uh, but um, you know, as I say, we, these projects we do, we care a lot about and we just do whatever it takes to, to get them made well. Absolutely. <laughs> and you're as committed to the exec ones as, as the producer ones. Any other questions? Anybody? Yes. Oh, time. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Sorry. It's, um, it's really an inspiration to hear what you just said about um, the kind of films, uh, about art and how to go forward with what's really authentic and not worry too much about what is expected either by a TV station or, or whatever that end product might be. Because I do agree with you that we're in such a great time to, to be able to be really creative 
And there's so many stories that need to be told differently, uh, whether it's age, whether it's the way we live, whether it's what we think, you know, what we think we need to do, how we need to live. So um, I'm a student currently of film, and there is usually a lot of critical argument about the type of films to make. Is it money first? Or is it the authenticity of the story first, right? So do you make a movie that you know will sell and therefore give people what you know they will pay for? Or do you go with what is authentic and then convince that there's a need for it? I'm not sure if there's a question in there, but I think what I want you to I'm do is... I'm not going to ask who your tutor is. <laughs> <laughs> so the point is some encouragement, something about, you know, you've already said some, but I just need you to say it again. Which one? <laughs> well, you know, you're not going to make... You know, money is it's, it's, it's not the issue. You'll, you'll make some money if you make a really good film. That's it. And you won't make any money if you make a bad film. And so uh, you just want to make a really good film. And, 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 yeah, that is about being true to it and... and following it not leading it as well i mean especially in, in this if you like documentary form we're talking about you know actually not imposing your own uh, ideas on it and, and being truly observing it and following it and you know there is this thread that if you follow will be the, the audience will follow i mean if you're trying to make things up or you know artificially tell a story then it, it's usually clunky and people feel it so uh, but yeah, without a doubt. I mean, I, I, you know, the only yeah, my only ambition is, is is to make more films, more good films, and obviously that requires money, and I need money to live. So clearly, we hope that. But I, I don't think you can have a say. Well, I'm going to make a load of money. Uh, you know, I'm going to make a film, make a load of money. I think that that would be insane. <laughs> and it, oh, to go and make a you know a fiction blockbuster or something, I and mean, that's quite hard to do as well. So. <laughs> you know. you I mean, sometimes quicker. you think, oh, no, this thing's going to be really commercial. We're going to make a film about a conspiracy theory about a secret weapon that's built next to Chernobyl. It's going to be, you know, in fact, that film, Woodpecker, which I hope we'll have a little look at later, you know, actually has finally done very well, but you know, it's just like it's the maddest um, business plan you've ever heard, you know. <laughs> we must talk about that, but let's, uh, let's go on to, to um, does that to some degree answer your question? Because I think there's quite a lot of pressure you know, from factual television, I think we have to think of factual television as almost something different, where you do think about the audience and make the films for the audience and money, but we're really not talking about that arena when we're talking about creative documentary. It worries me when people say you have to think about your audience first. That's my opinion. I, 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 I'm I the audience. I, I just make f with others films that I really want to see and I really like. And, I, and, you know, I don't sit in front of television and watch all this stuff. I don't watch it ever, so why would I even think about making it? I mean, the things I might watch on television would be good documentaries and Channel 4 News I would give a shout out to. I think it's unbelievably good. Um, so you know, you, and and people that do these, I don't, I'm not, I, I'm I'm definitely not a snob. I think people that make this other kind of stuff are really good at it, and I don't, you know, I don't get up in the morning thinking about that. They do, and and good luck to them. And and you know, there is a tremendous skill in it. I'm not saying there isn't. It's not easy by far, but it's just not. I'm just not. You know, it just doesn't compel me at all. And there are so it's many things that skill. do compel me. You know, there are so many of these things that come across your desk. Uh, and you go, well, if there's any way we can possibly do that, we should try. So let's talk about Pussy Riot. Yeah. <laughs> so what's your thing about Russia? Well, I don't really have a thing about Russia, but I, and I'd, I'd worked, again, going back to my previous sort of art, art film world, where I did a lot of film, a lot of films, some films in Central Asia and, you know, been to Russia a lot filming, and, 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 but, but in a different context. And... Yeah, I mean, what attracted me to Pussy Riot was punk rock, really. I mean, you know, I'm of an age where that was a kind of influential moment in my, our lives. And, and you know, I just open The Guardian and see a picture of them doing their stuff and thinking, this is so great, punk is back, and <laughs> it's yeah, taking on the world. And then, then they get arrested and you think, well, this is the film we have to make. And... Uh, so, you know, we just leapt on it and, you know, and, and, and you know, it was, again, it was a quite pretty tricky film to make, as most films are, but 
You no, co-directed this, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I started directing it. I mean, I, I started, you know, I knew I had to make this film, and so I just started making it, basically. And then, fortunately, you know, I, I, Max I knew before, and he was in Moscow during the trial, and he was obviously great help in pulling together various aspects of the film and, and, and you know, uh, it, you know we, we, we made a good film together. But, uh, but I, I, as I say, you know, you see one image and you go, I have to do that if I can. And of course, uh, again, people can remain nameless. But actually, BBC came in pretty early on it, actually, to their absolute credit. But others were like, mm, it's Russian. Mm. <laughs> Like, you know, and, 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 you know, and that would still be their attitude. It's like, you know, to get foreign language films on, on mainstream television is almost impossible, which is diabolical. But so anyway, it was so, just... So did you just, just sort of, as you, you said, did you start <laughs> pulling in strings of bits and stuff or did you yeah, again, go there straight away? Talk. Well, no, I went there straight away. First thing I did was r rang them up. And say, and oh, hello, can I come and see you? Right, and, yeah, pretty, you know, they have a pretty well established kind of, you know, organization, as it were. And, um, and, uh, and Peter, who's Nadia's husband, is, you know, half Canadian or something, and anyway, fluent English speaker. And so it was very easy to sort of communicate with them. I, mean, I don't speak Russian, so. Um, and we just went out there and started doing it. I mean, again, that's, that would be my advice to anybody that wants to make a film just do it. Just start doing it. If you've got a hundred quid Ryan airfare to go to the place that this person is with a with your mate's camera, whatever, then you just have to start because once you start, then you you've got something to play with and you've got it's got an energy of its own and you know. And you're committed. Yeah, yeah. And, and 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 you know and 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 then you know. Um, Plus, you know, ultimately, if you are then pitching this to others, they'll see how into it you are. That's a very effective sales tool, is your own commitment and energy and excitement about a thing. It's like, oh, here's some films we might do. It's not. It's a thought, we're doing this, and if you, you, you know, if you were smart, you would <laughs> come in and help us do it. So you went and did some filming post their performance in the, in the church? Yeah, so we, we started <coughs> filming them... Um, about two weeks after they'd been arrested. I mean, fortunately, again, for the film, there, there was a significant amount of archive of them before yeah. doing this. And in fact, in fact, the BBC in Moscow shot their rehearsal for the punk prayer thing they did, amazingly. So there's a great, and we acquired this, there's a great scene in the film with them practicing uh, this thing they're about to do, which is really fantastic. Um, so, and then, yeah, and then we arrived and they, um, at the first bail hearing they're at, um, we're filming at, which is, again, a most amazing scene. You know, you've got this tiny room with about 150 journalists from Russia. I mean, there were no foreign journalists there except for us. Uh, and, uh, you know, suddenly they walk in and it's, it's amazing. I mean, it's just, the, you know, they, they had the world in the palm of their hand, you know, listening to them and obviously not understanding them, but like compelled to sort of listen to them. It's really extraordinary. And they're pretty amazing women. They are. They are. They're Super clever. They're, again, they're artists. You know, they know how to use art to, to... This is the whole point. They're using art, whether it's a coloured balaclava or a bit of music or this performance approach or not. Again, it can be anything. I mean, they're not, they're not fixed to any particular medium, you know. And, uh, and really what they were doing was creating online videos. That's, that was essentially the, the art they were making at that time. So... Um, you know, what's not to like? <laughs> Shall we share the clip? Yeah. Has anybody seen this film? Yes, I have. Oh, yes, okay, good. Are they all free and happy now? Let's yeah. see the clip and then you can ask that one. Here's a, a regular of ours. <laughs> Это главный храм, который символизирует между собой, символизирует собой слияние церкви и государства. Это ненормальная вещь. Если вот тоже любимое слово, не справедливо. Она без с умом такая. Управляющие все. Группа, да? Есть группа. Да. Такого 
это никогда не вызывало понимания. Нет, появляются люди, которые оправдывают это кощунство. Ибо нет у нас будущего, если перед святынями великими мы начинаем глумиться. Чем сильнее государство давит, тем, тем, тем больше... Почувствуйте с нами запах свободы. Uh, the question was, are they all free and happy now after their imprisonment? Yeah, they're, they're free and, they're, yeah, I mean, they're still causing trouble in their own way. So they're no longer a group, as it were, I don't think, but um, they're still intent on causing trouble. So that's the main thing. I was just stunned by their eloquence, I have to say. Uh, it just must be something Russian. There's just something well, very something poetic Russian. about even Actually, there. Well, there is something Russian, and, and, and the levels of education and, and sophistication and of art appreciation that exists in Russia is still very impressive. And, you know, there was a... I mean, I tell this story about why Russia is interesting. There was a case about a year ago of these two guys that got into a fight and somebody was killed in an argument over which is better, poetry or literature. <laughs> and this is a true story. And this, and this is how, I mean, that would not happen in America, I don't think. <laughs> no. um, so, and then not to be patronizing and not to characterize an entire nation, of course there are, you know, many variants and all that. But, well, I mean, he's, you know, but, uh, but there, it is a fascinating culture, of course, yeah, and, and people do say and do things that they wouldn't do in other places. And they make great films. Yeah, they certainly do. Okay, uh, how many times did you have to pitch that to get the money for production, um, to complete? Well, again, you know, um, Brit.com came in and BBC came in, and then actually after that, um, and I had to obviously pitch to various other people, after that, we sort of just about had enough of resources to get the thing done. So, um, so, and then we actually sold the film at Sundance, you know. So, I mean, I'm a great believer if you possibly can uh, assemble a film on whatever resources you have and keeping all your rights and then selling the thing as a whole is usually a more profitable way. But usually, obviously, you, you don't have the luxury of doing that and you are selling off rights to individual countries or broadcasters in order to get the film funded of course so uh but if you can keep as much to yourself and that means obviously not paying yourself or um but then that can be a lucrative um thing to do yes um sorry a bit of a random question um so you're talking about um <laughs> so you're talking about um where the girls are now um but in terms of um, dealing with people that are kind of in a violent situation or, you know, victimised or something. Um, do you find yourself kind of looking after them or dealing with them or helping them out after you've made a film? Is there any kind of, like, support for them after or do you just kind of make the film and the rest is kind of their situation? <laughs> Split. No, I mean, I think it's very important that you're not simply exploiting somebody's misery, essentially, um, and not in their case, because ultimately they, you know, they, they survived and thrived and, and, you know, they have a huge support network internationally anyway, so they weren't reliant on us. But in other cases, absolutely, you have a great responsibility to your subject. I mean, they're making you your film. You owe them everything. And, and uh, you know, and certainly the something one is has to be very concerned about is the security and safety of people within your film and it may not only be the protagonist it could be people helping you make the film or you know and and, and very that's the number one priority is is their protection and because again i would rather never make a film again ever than have someone be killed or imprisoned because of something i've done i mean forget it it's just, it isn't worth that so 
and, and very often, you know, these things are very complicated and, 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 and sometimes, I mean, not necessarily in films I made, but in other films that are associated with it. Yeah, you have to provide a, an exit strategy for the people within the film. And, and uh, in fact, interestingly, I mean, um, in Afghan Star, the, uh, the presenter of the show, Daoud, who's a fantastic character in the film and really amazing, and uh, got a visa for him to come to Sundance uh, to present the film. And then he claimed political asylum in the US on that trip, which, <coughs> you know, um, for good reason. I mean, he's definitely a marked man in, in Afghanistan and convinced the Americans that he was, it was too dangerous for him to return. So that wasn't planned. <laughs> um, but obviously, we we're glad that he was able to do that. He's still in the US and he's fine and, and all this. Although it's obviously tragic that you have to leave your country and he certainly loved his country. So it's, 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 it's not ideal, but it's at least he's safe, you know. And there's a the big issue of the fixers, isn't there? Which yeah, is one of the major Absolutely. Problems. This is a very, you know, that, in a way, sometimes films are actually not possible to make because of that. Mm -hmm. Because if you made it, the people involved in it would, would would Good. suffer, and, mm. it's, and, and as, uh, as tragic as that is, because it's important to tell these stories, as I say, no film is worth someone's life or, or, or liberty, yeah. in my view. Agreed. Others might but uh, there are quite a lot of fixers who have suffered hugely, Absolutely. the untold heroes of yep. uh, foreign, certainly foreign journalism. Yep. Uh, let's jump forward here, because we're jumping out of time. Okay. <laughs> so let's jump forward to your next Russian film. The Russian woodpecker, and uh, now we're in 2015. How did that happen? Well, that happened because at some time in the afternoon, I received an email from Chad, the director. Um, first saying, time director. First time director. Um, he said, "Oh, I'm trying to make this film for you know, like a short film for the internet, but and I don't know if you're interested in it. And here's some material. And then again, I click on the material." And about four minutes later, I replied to him saying, this is incredible, we have to talk. <laughs> so, again, it's pretty crazy stuff, but there's just something about, I don't know, it just had an atmosphere and, a, and it didn't, didn't even really explain what the story was, which is still, we still have difficulty explaining what the story is, but basically it's about uh, uh, the, this artist's obsession with uh, a secret weapon that the Russians built next door, literally, to Chernobyl. And the idea is that the accident at Chernobyl was not an accident, but something caused deliberately to cover up the failure of this weapon, which is a massive radio antenna designed to beam low-frequency radio signals into America to drive everybody crazy. Some would suggest that that actually worked, but, <laughs> but it didn't work. Uh, and this is a film about it. <laughs> Should we show a clip? Yeah. The noise is called the woodpecker because it makes a picking noise. Могла ли быть связь русского дятла и аварии на Чернобыле такая? Я хочу узнать. И кто в этом виноват? Кто-то на них надавил и взрывается. Полковник говорит тебе, Гэру, говорит, какая проблема. Сейчас я не для камеры. Я боюсь. Советская система зла. Как ты заметил, ведут в Москву. В этой трагедии должны быть свои причины. И случайностей не бывает. Uh, 
I love this film uh, because your feet are never ever quite on the ground. I think it's uh, fascinating, and I love the idea that we wouldn't have uh, Mr. Trump if it wasn't for the Russian woodpecker. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> it was successful. Zap them again, it might right. change them. <laughs> but but um, <clears throat> you said it had a slow burn, and we, we won't talk about raising money because we talked about that before. But that, uh, that it was difficult to get it out. I remember we showed it for a week, but it was not didn't get big distribution here. So how did you get it out to an audience? Well, we 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 <coughs> uh, we basically participated in Sundance Film Festival and won the Grand Jury Prize there, which was obviously fantastically <laughs> good. And uh, then still struggled ultimately to, I mean, eventually it did sell well, eventually. And uh, Arte took the film and various others and, and, uh, and um, you know, Amazon, in fact, uh, took the film. And it you know, ended up fine, but it, it took a long time to get there. And people either love it or hate it. And it's a very, it's all about marketing, as I was talking about before. You know, it's really difficult in a, in, in, to easily kind of explain what the film is, and it's 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 that's its strength in many ways, but it makes it difficult for you know others. And and you know, in terms of let's say uh, the major state British broadcaster, who initially absolutely loved the film, but really couldn't kind of back it because it was like. Is this a bit of journalism? Is it, you know, we're basically yeah. accusing the Russians of deliberately causing this massive accident for particular reasons. And that's a, quite an outlandish thing to say. And I think you can say it in the context of a creative polemic, but, you know, and state broadcaster broadcasting that, although other state broadcasters have broadcast it. So they, so they never partook of this film, which actually was, a, a, you know, a great sadness to me because. I, you know, I, it is a great film, and it is something that you know should be supported. But and nevertheless, anyway, they didn't. So to this Storyville day, Storyville took it, didn't they? No, no, no. They didn't. No, no, no. They couldn't. They couldn't because they couldn't. The editorial policy board, uh, the BBC, You're didn't kidding. like it. Yeah. Well, this is, happens a lot, you know. Um, because it's what is it you know is it true is it untrue i mean that, that, who cares you know it's 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 both it's 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 what it's, it's, it's what it is is a film of a sophisticated analysis of the relationship between ukraine and russia at a time where that relationship was in total meltdown i mean the yeah. film halfway through the film the maidan uh, uh, um, uh, revolt takes place and of course that you know <laughs> Anyway, so I think it's a really important film in, 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 in describing that relationship and, and the fears that both sides have of each other, etc. And, uh, and the role that I think Chernobyl played in the demise of the Soviet Union. Anyway, it was like a pivotal moment. It would destroy the, the Russian economy and the building of that antenna as well was one of the things that crippled the Soviet economy. So it's like a really important thing, and uh, and it's fun and entertaining. And Fedor is a brilliant, brilliant character that everybody just adores. I mean, he's such an amazing guy. And you know, whenever you have him at a Q and A, or I mean, he's been a smash hit. I mean, the film's done uh, many festivals, and uh, wherever he goes, he leaves these adoring people <laughs> in his wake. You know, I remember seeing you with him. I think it was Sheffield. But, but that what you're saying is so so important because that's why. Uh, cinematic documentaries are so powerful because they can cross a line and be um, and be funny about a very serious issue, which is often much more. I mean, look at uh, several uh, programs of satire, much more powerful than um, a panorama on the issue. Um, so, big loss to television, yeah. and well done for the film. Thank you. We're getting really close to the end now, I'm afraid. So, yeah, question, go ahead. And another one at the front here. Oh, and another one at the back. Ten minutes. We've got another clip to show. Yeah, I, want to show um, video. I was just wondering, you seem to work with first-time filmmakers a lot, so I was wondering whether that's a, a choice you like working with first-time filmmakers or and what kind of help you need to give them, usually? Good question. Yeah, well, I, it's it's a very special thing to work on someone's first film. I mean, I'm not saying that someone's first film is their best film, but but quite often it can be. And, and the amount of energy and soul and everything that someone puts into their first film is is different to subsequent films, and especially if that film is successful, then 
you know, their expectations are completely different and their method is completely different. So there is something very special about and seeing somebody realize what they have and, 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 and see, can see how it can be achieved. You know, that's really a fantastic feeling. And uh, so it, it's a very special thing. And, uh, and you know, uh, you know, you can, it's, it, you know, it, it, it's great that these people come to us with their, with their, with their projects. I mean, it's, uh, you know, I'm very, very grateful that people do, that trust us with their, with their work, Vision. you know. Yeah, so it's a great thing and I'm very, you know, it's a great privilege actually. Excellent. Very quickly, we have one more clip we must show. Go ahead. Um, the, the China incident, did the Chinese government only come after you um, because it was a controversial piece of information? Would they, and did they do anything to you? The, they, well, they ban I still have a, a little um, stamp in Chinese in, my, in red in my passport saying I'm a persona non grata. Because can you not go back? So this is, this is 10 more, 15 years, and they still won't let me back. Was was that just because you filmed? I've just been to yeah. China. <laughs> well, and, and, and what they were annoyed about, I mean, they were annoyed about the content of the film, but what they were mostly annoyed about is that we'd done it without their permission. Oh. So that's the point. We went in as tourists and made this thing and got out and did it. Oh. So that's what they didn't like. And, and, and you know, um, and that, you know, that did have consequences for Channel 4. Originally, they were threatening to ban any Channel 4 news crews or anybody from going to China. I and mean, eventually, they relented and it was just, you know. And what about if... <clears throat> I've just come back from China, and uh, what about if all you're doing is saying good things about China? Would they still come after somebody? Um, <laughs> like me? What, they're not going to come after you. I mean, they're just going to, you know... I mean, Stamp your passport. <laughs> I, I need to go back. Well, <laughs> then you should time your return to not coincide with the release of your film or something. I don't know. I mean, if, um, it'd, be, it'd be hard to judge without knowing what the film is and, I'll let you, you know... <laughs> Very quickly, just shout. Hi. Um, so far. Uh, I was just interested, especially where you follow distribution through getting it out on the festival, um, but then getting it sold after sometimes is a struggle, for example, the Russian Woodpecker. I was wondering, what are your thoughts about um, online distribution and directly reaching your audience um, and online platforms in general? I think they're the, the best thing ever and, and you know, and, and especially one of the particular characteristics of these online platforms is that they are looking at, at an international audience and don't care what language your film is in. In fact, it's a positive advantage that it's in Russian or in Chinese or because they've got huge audiences in these places. So I think it's, 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 it's a fantastically good thing and oh, some are better than others and it's still very much something that is developing, but it's, it's, it's actually transformed um, the possibilities for our work actually it's it's because you, you literally have international distribution on a, on a film that would have taken or well, would never have happened before simple as that so okay i'm going to jump yeah. in so um please tell us about pino yeah so i wanted to just finish by showing you a clip um a trailer we we just made for a, a new project that we're still in the process of financing uh and we're getting back to this idea of troublemakers, and 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 to me, Pino is a supreme troublemaker, and uh, I think the trailer kind of speaks for itself. So I'll let you watch that. Il mio nome è Pino Maniaci. Sono un giornalista e dirigo la mia piccola emittente televisiva qui in Sicilia. Gestisco la mia tv con mia moglie, i miei figli e i miei cani. Per le mie battaglie contro la mafia sono diventato famoso e rispettato nel mondo intero. Che il pizzo non si paga. Ma qui in Sicilia non tutti mi amano. Tre anni fa qualcuno mi ha detto che c'era qualcosa che non andava nel tribunale di Palermo e ho iniziato ad indagare. 
la mafia nell'antimafia e continuiamo a ripetere che c'è qualcosa che non va. Ma quello che non sapevo era che la polizia aveva iniziato a spiarmi 24 ore su 24. In piena notte la polizia mi ha arrestato insieme a nove boss mafiosi. Sono stato accusato di estorcere denaro al sindaco locale. Il reato rimane aperto e continuerà la sua storia. Ma come si è difeso? No, 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 non l'hai fatto. L'altra faccia di Dino Maniaci, niente affatto eroe della legalità, quella che emergerebbe dalle intercettazioni dei carabinieri. Per vent'anni la mafia ha provato a fermarmi, a intimidirmi, a uccidermi, ma non ho mai smesso di lottare. I proiettili non mi hanno fermato. Adesso provano ad usare il potere della legge per farmi stare zitto. Ma io non mi arrendo. Pino non si arrende mai. So, yeah, so in March he stands trial accused of um, blackmail and all sorts of things. But it's, it's a huge case in Italy and I think obviously it is a, quite a lot like the Pussy Riot thing. It's really exposing, you know, the, the nature of, of, of the legal system and the politics and the role it plays in, in people like Pino who are trying to expose wrongdoing. So he's a, uh, I was described as a cross between um, Basil Forty and Serpico. And, uh, <laughs> He's terrific. He is terrific, yeah. What so, stage is the film at? Well, very. Uh, the, the filmmakers are two uh, Sicilian filmmakers that have been working with him for several years. Um, and I started in the summer to work with him because this trial was coming up. Um, so we're really just uh, at the early stages of that bit of it. And we'll be filming all next year as this trial proceeds. So this is... a. Pitch piece. Yeah, that is a t exactly. That's exactly what that is. And you're raising money for them. Yeah. So if anybody's got any money, don't want to do it. <laughs> it's going to be a great film. Uh, no, I'm really excited because you know, again, you know, you're only as good as your next thing, and to find a character like that is, I mean, it's very exciting. I mean, it really is. It's like I think he's, he's such a universal character because he's deeply flawed, and there's all kinds of things about him that you probably wouldn't like, and all that sort of stuff and he's a really grumpy guy and all this but nevertheless he's at his heart he's 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 challenging corruption and he's challenging the system and he's encouraging people to do the same and i think that's really admirable and brave so Mike, are you aiming to cover his trial? In the yeah, film? yeah, we and we we can actually film his trial because, in, yeah, in fact, the, the 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 one of the directors, two directors, one of the directors' mother was the head of the Palermo court, yeah. so we have a very good image of the court, which is great. So yeah, it's going to be a yeah exciting uh, film, and uh, we'll see what happens. <laughs> Mike, um, thank you very much for coming, and I just want to say I think it's absolutely incredible. After so many years of constantly working, you know, and trying to make a living as well as do films, you have so much enthusiasm. I think you're to be totally admired. Thank you very much. Thank you very and much. carry on.